there are two forces acting in any flow of water. That there is the force of gravity which flows from the source down to the sea, and there's the force of levity which flows from the sea back up to the source again. And the trout responds and is able to manipulate the forces of gravity and the forces of levity in order to maintain its station in flowing water. The extraordinary thing is that when a trout is startled from its lair or where it's reposing, then it accelerates upstream with extraordinary velocity, using the force of levity to move itself upstream. Victor Schauberger found himself in a very high alpine virgin forest, which he frequented so often, and in which he found the most extraordinary events. He came across them. It was though he was almost ordained to be there at the right time in order to perceive them. He came across this fast-flowing upland stream in which there was a trout, one of these stationary trout, just with a very slight flick of its tail, was standing in this rushing water. And apart from its station there, uh, which of course asked, made him ask the question of how it was able to stand there and so on, he knew that about a kilometer downstream there was a waterfall a very high waterfall where the falling water atomized into mist. And so how was it possible, he asked himself, that this trout managed to get to this spot? Because they always come back to their spawning grounds to breed again. And from these sort of insights, he evolved the idea of this interaction of two energies, of this gravitational movement from the source to the sea and from the sea back up to the source again. And the trout uses the levitational force in order to surmount these waterfalls. And it circles down at the bottom of the waterfall until it finds this upward vortex and then throws itself into the vortex which then sucks it up and eventually ends up on the up upstream end of it. Victor Schauberger decided to test this out. Victor had asked some of his foresters to boil up a cauldron of about 100 litres of water, about 150 metres upstream. And on his signal, they poured the water into the stream. And as soon as the water hit the stream, 150 metres up from where the fish was, the fish started to, to flail its tail as hard as it could and went backwards. Something had been cut in the water. The energy, which was the levitational force, had been destroyed by heat. The levitational force is the, the bioenergetic force, the biomagnetic force. It is the life force. And Victor observed these moss tips. The moss tips pointed up against the stream, against the current. But when the water was heated up through deforestation, then the moss tips pointed downstream, although because the water had heated, it was less dense than it was before. So he regarded these tips of the moss as being an indicator, indicating the health or disease of a, of, a, of a stream. There is also another process by which the trout enables itself to stay in the fast flowing water. And that is through the difference between the speed of the water as it flows past the trout's body and trout's breathing itself. According to Victor Schauberger, every particle of water is associated with a particular velocity and a particular temperature. And if the temperature relative to that velocity is exceeded, then turbulence automatically occurs. So in the terms of the trout, it's sitting with its body in the center, the coldest core water of the stream. And as the water filaments approach the body, they get squeezed aside by the body and in the process accelerate. And as they accelerate, they exceed their specific velocity relative to temperature, and turbulence occurs on the rear flank of the trout, which acts so it actually propels the trout upstream. The trout breathes in, or at least it takes in water through its lungs, extracts the oxygen from the water, or a large part of it, which then that water passes out through the, through the gills in a semi-oxygen deficient state. And as a result of its lack of oxygen, it absorbs oxygen 
from the surrounding water and expands. And this expansion is also pushed on the back of the trout which squeezes it forward like a, like a bar of soap. So when it wants to accelerate, it flaps its gills very fast and that creates more turbulence and also because there is a greater expulsion of oxygen deficient water that means there's a greater expansion of water behind it which pushes the trout forward upstream. When we approach a new way of designing or a new way of looking at moving water for instance then we have to design a process which allows water to change and to transform and to move and to be itself, fundamentally to be itself. And there was a time when Victor, early, fairly early in his days, built a log flume for the transport of logs down the mountain. When it came to build it, it was going to be constructed out of timber and it was going to be a half egg shape in the profile. So that there was this shape made out of wooden slats and when the workers asked him well, how, where they were going to build it, he said, well now you see the valley here and see the river, so that's the way that the energies like to move in this situation, so we copy that. And one of his great adages was comp comprehend and copy nature. Because nature knows how the best how to do things and has known best for years. It's only human beings who decide arbitrarily to impose their own laws or what they think are laws which are actually only half laws um, in the case of gravity for instance with the total negation of levity there's the law of gravity but there is the law of levity in fact there's the law of both together so in this log flume which was built to follow the contours of the valley there were slats attached to the sides of the walls on left hand bends and on right hand bends so that the water was caused to rotate or to form longitudinal forces anti-clockwise and then clockwise as it went around these bends. In this first instance built in Steierling, uh, this uh, was constructed for Prince Adolf zu Schaumburg Lippe who was the owner of great forest estates and the lateral length of the flume was about two kilometers. The water and temperature was very strictly controlled. Victor determined that in order to make the flume function properly, in order to generate the right energies, it was necessary to introduce different temperatures of water into the flume. From the surface of the water to the bottom of the holding basin, there's a thermal stratification, that the water stratifies itself according to temperature and density, so that the coldest water, the four degree water, is at the bottom of the basin, and gradually the water heats as it goes towards the top and so there would have been a pipe which took bottom water out, the four degree water out then another one maybe at six degrees and another one taking the nine degree water out and these would have been introduced into the flume tangentially so that they automatically inaugurated a spiral movement a vortical movement, a longitudinal vortical movement in which the coldest water would have been at the center surrounded by the water with less density and greater temperature the colder the water is, the more laminar its flow. That means that it's more straight line movement, although it was still screwing, it's still spiraling. And the logs, the heavy beach logs, which were, were otherwise called sinkers because they sunk to the bottom, were suspended in this central uh, vertical flow, this cold water, because they were denser than the densest water, and the only place that they could be was in the center of the dense water and they were conducted all the way down these flumes without touching the sides and his flumes were so successful that actually about nine of them were built it was this phenomenon that enabled Victor to transport logs which were heavier than water down his log flume without touching the sides now these logs were known as sinkers because normally they were heavier than water and they dropped to the bottom but because of this centripetal 